Namaste. We continue with Collected Works of Sherbinda, Volume 27, Letters on Poetry and Art. So it's very interesting when we see how the mother and Sherbindo have uh, very like in a very complementary way, complementing each other, complementing in the sense that they have distributed the work so beautifully. They are one and the same, yet for the sake of work, has to. So we see that uh, when it comes to matters of the head and beyond the head, intellect, we see that Sherbindo takes that entire field. And whereas when it comes to matters of the heart, depths of the heart, it is the mother who works, as if she works from the heart, through the heart, and Shurabindo from the mind, through the mind, pressing the light. So between them, very beautifully they have distributed the work. Then again we see Shurabindo has mainly used the uh, written mode. In fact, that is the mode. Nobody has recorded Shurabindo's voice. But there is an certain advantage in the conversational mode. So the advantage is that intonations can be caught much better than by simply writing. So that is something very interesting that the mother has used conversations. And second is any conversation because writing is always invariably impersonal. It comes from a great height. There is nobody, nobody who is a listener. So it is like the cosmos is the listener. And the seer receives in the silence of his soul's soul and uh, just shares it for the joy and delight of it. But in conversation, it gets modified automatically based on the listener. And that's what we see in mother's conversation. Very often there will be a question and the mother's reply will be, she'll start from one point, go through an entire cosmos and then come back. As if she's responding not just to the question, not as if, because that's what she has said, but to the consciousness which is behind and to the collective consciousness of the people who are present. So between them again we see this beautiful distribution of work, writing and conversation. Then we see again Shurabindo working from deep within and above. So people are not uh, directly interacting with him except through the letters. Whereas with the mother, she is entering into the forefront. So she is playing tennis, she is going to the playground, she is involved in all the various activities of the ashram, drama and music and stores and business and everything else. Whereas Shurabindo, from behind, he is handling all the forces that are working from behind. Whereas she is right in the forefront, like um, as we see in our Puranic literature when Durga is fighting, uh, then Shiva is standing behind, supporting her from behind, watching over her. And that was the reason why Shobindo met with that accident. Because he was, he says he was so busy protecting the mother that he never thought that these forces can dare to attack him. And they atta even a small little unsuspecting moment like that. Then we see again in terms of... Um, Especially art, music, poetry, Shurabindo has given great importance. He has said that art, music and poetry are a perfect education for the soul. So we see Shurabindo takes up the field of poetry. Mother also used to write poetry when she was 15, 16 and she didn't get it along. Uh, once by chance her mother happened, her physical mother happened to see it and she thought her daughter is going mad. <laughs> <laughs> so, she used to write poetry, but poetry is a field which primarily Shurabindo has taken. Whereas we see music and painting is a field primarily the mother has taken. And very interesting when we see these things in a hierarchical way, the mother once describes that words come from a high region. These words which express a greater truth. And then beyond these words, music comes. And beyond the music is the world of pure lights, differentiate colors and dimensions, which means in a way painting should capture. But most of the painting and music does not come from these high realms, just as most of the words, even eloquence of speech doesn't come from these high realms. Much of it comes from the vital. But these are the domains. And beyond that, of course, there is silence. So between them, they have taken the entire work within, outside 
the mother going as outward as the physical body and matter and shobindo going as within and to the height of the very transcendent as if from there he is sending and the divine mother is receiving and distributing to all and that's where we see that when on 29th february 1956 the supramental manifestation took place the mother hears the command from above and she says it is in english it's very interesting <laughs> it is shurbindo who literally he sees that the world is ready creation is ready for the manifestation not for completely receiving it so he says the hour has come and the mother strikes with the hammer so it's it's amazing to see them work together in such a beautiful way so we continue with these letters coming straight to the letters so one thing which we often at least i have made this observation people translate shubindo and the mother and especially shubindo's writings the prose writings very often are more difficult to read um, i don't know about other languages but in hindi for sure than the original however difficult the english may be still one can read the sentence is easy to understand the turn of phrases but in hindi because people have done a literal transform translation and when it comes to poems it's near impossible because it's not about literally translating and this several times i have spoken about it that savitri now when you translate it literally at least i have felt that all the charm and joy is lost thought is there but poetry is not philosophy that's what shirobindo repeated details us if poetry and philosophy are same then there is no need of a separate medium so when we translate we have to catch something and that's where we have a letter of shirobindo though he has written the same thing about it he himself is translated and when we see his translations of shankaracharya's hymn to bhavani and from the ramayana from the mahabharata we can see the difference shirobindo is able to communicate what is behind the words because that is the beauty words are a medium it's not simply about literally translating but they are a medium through which something is being communicated and that's where the translators real merit or demerit comes in so here there is a letter on literalness and freedom with regard to translations and shubindo says a translator is not necessarily bound to the exact word and letter of the original he chooses he can make his own poem out of it if he likes and that is what is very often done there were people who translated shirobindo's poem and shirobindo said no it doesn't capture this thought at all this feel is not there because that translation it becomes flat so he says and this is what is very often done this and then he says this is all the more legitimate since we find that literal translations are more completely literal translations more completely betray than those that are reasonably free turning life into death and poetic power into poverty and flatness it is so true at least for savitri i can vouch safe Uh, when we read the literal translation which is standard available i won't say who's where um, where it's a word by word translation that joy is lost something is grossly missing it's like a philosophy you try to understand what it, but that's not how poetry is understood whereas when we read a more free flowing poetic translation in hindi i am speaking of say of vidyavati kokil it's amazing it's a pity that only seven volumes are available or i have seen some of the prayers more recently done by uh, one of my friend arun chaturvedi very nice he has taken up passages and given them a very poetic turn are, i think i will able on aroma the link so he has taken few passages and taken up or i have seen some of these poems of shirobindo translated by chote narayan ji where he catches the essence and brings it in a rhythm uh, and the joy of poetry which is most important aspect that is not lost because poetry is about delight we had read that in shobindo's future poetry delight is a very important ingredient of poetry as he says there are five sons of poetry so there is truth beauty delight good power all these should be present now power gets missing when there are literal translations 
beauty is missing because that rhythm, that delight is missing. Truth probably something is captured, but truth when it is cut off from all this loses its uh, sense. So he says that to do that is uh, literal translations turn life into death and poetic power into poverty and flatness. It is not many who can carry over the spirit of a poem. The characteristic power of its expression and the turn of its rhythmical movement from one language to another, especially when the tongues in question are so alien in temperament to each other as English and Bengali, when that can be done, there is perfect translation. So he says, especially alien tongues, even Hindi and English, very different tongues. The expressions, the turn of speech, the diction, poetry flows from that. They are very different. <clears throat> then we see a lot of humor here. You know, I wish there was a volume in collected works on humor of Shurbindo. But there is a book called Shurbindo's Humor, which is thankfully available. So, but in these volumes and as also in letters, we will see a lot of humor. Actually, humor is throughout Shurbindo's writings. In Live Divine, there is humor. When he gives the example of a so-called witness and several other places. In Savitri, there is humor. It's very interesting that, you know, at places there is a very irony, even death. And mother brings it out in her commentaries. She said, this fellow, this, uh, <laughs> the way she addresses death. So, here he very humorously says something very interesting. The proper rule about literalness, I suppose, is that one should keep as close as possible to the original provided the result is that the translation does not read like a translation but like an original poem and as far as possible as if it were the original poem originally written in Bengali or whatever language. And then he says, I admit, now comes the humor part, I admit that I have not practiced what I preached Whenever I translated, I was careless of the hurt feelings of the original text and transmogrified it without mercy into whatever my fancy chose. <laughs> but that is a high and mighty criminality which one ought not to imitate. <laughs> Latterly, I have tried to be more moral in my ways. I mean, this is amazing. Shurvindo only can write like this. I don't know with what success, but anyhow, it is a case of do what I preach and avoid what I practice. <laughs> Only the Lord can ride with such a wonderful magnificence and height. Then there is a very interesting short letter about mind fatigue. All kinds of letters are there that mind gets fatigued while writing. So he says that when you try to do something with a lot of intensity, which involves intensity, or it is a mechanical routine work. Then after a while the mind gets fatigued. So what is to be done? He advises either take rest or change whatever you are doing. And this is exactly what modern psychologists advise. This is by the way an aside advice for all the students and everyone. After two hours take a break. Give your mind a little rest. Turn 10-15 minutes here and there. Or take up a different activity. If you read the same thing throughout continuously, people have this ignorant belief that if we study for uh, 12 hours continuously, we will do better. It's not true because the mind will go into a fatigue and when the mind goes into a fatigue, then automatically, spontaneously, it starts shutting down its system. We don't realize it. Our will wants to drive it, but it shuts down. And therefore, an advice is that, well... Um, just around the corner when exams are coming, <laughs> give your mind proper rest, maybe play a game, even otherwise it helps a lot. And here I must say I have practiced it, what I am preaching, it not only takes the mind away from that constant growth, so that when you go for the actual exam, you will be better, the mind will be open, ready to receive and express. Otherwise I have seen people studying for 18 hours, I don't know how they study, 16 hours, and then the mind goes into a shutdown mode because it's a machine. You can't help it. it the brain is a machine. Mind is not. But it enters a shutdown mode because it's so much stimulated that right in the exam, fear takes over, emotions take over and it goes into a shutdown mode. 
So he speaks about it that it's not something serious. All that it needs is that means that it is strained, needs rest so that the force may gather again. Rest or a variation. These are the two things Shurabindu suggests. Then there is a whole uh, wonderful, there are some poems which Shurabindu has, uh, you know, given his own comments on his own poems, which is so beautiful. For those who may like to read a poem and may not know uh, what it means, so at least for a few poems, very few, like Rose of God or Thought the Paraclet, it's a difficult poem. And uh, one can read the poem and read Shurabindu's uh, few comments. So they are very interesting. Okay. <clears throat> so someone has asked him a question. This is another very often mistaken thing. That, oh, mystics, they are very average people. Not realizing most of the mystics are extremely brilliant minds. And that is why they have realized that human knowledge systems, philosophies, intellect is very limited. Precisely because they are intelligent. But their intelligence therefore begins to scan and search other fields. But someone has asked Sherbindo, a great scientist has written that mystics and spiritual men the world over have in general always been men of very average intelligence. A handful of rare instances accepted. This is what someone has asked Sherbindo. Sherbindo replies, as for your great scientist, now you see, even when he writes, the way the turn of phrase, he is not saying according to science, he is saying, as for your great scientist, self proclaimed great scientist, I wonder who he had in mind as spiritual men. So far as I know, history, both in the East and the West, there have been any number of spiritual men and mystics who have had a great or fine intellectual capacity or were endowed with a great administrative and organizing ability, implying a keen knowledge of men and much expenditure of brain power. With a little looking up of the records of the past, I think one could collect some hundreds of names, which would not include, of course, the still greater number, not recorded in history or the transmitted memory of the past. So, of course, there are many mystics. They don't care about uh, putting their name in Guinness book. Uh, so they are not after name and fame. So if you search for them, you, you may not find it. So this is what he says that actually most of them are in, a, in fact endowed with a great degree of intelligence. It's just that their genius has turned in another direction because they have realized very soon the limits of the cage. <clears throat> so then of course we know what his opinion was about Freud, not opinion, his understanding, very clear. Uh, he spoke about uh, psychoanalysts like uh, their A, B, C. They are still learning the A, B, C of the inner realms. And he says that uh, often he is like a person who has entered into a dark domain without even a candle or a little bit of candle flare. And they think that their A, B, C is the whole of knowledge. And then some, when someone asked him, he said, well, most of their theories are either unsound or exaggerated. They pick up a truth. Or a fact, like Freud uh, spoke about the suppression of things which we don't want to express openly. So they are suppressed and kept in the subconscious. So this is, yes, that is true. But then he has exaggerated as if that is the whole of things. And that's so true, evident from his writings. And for those who are very, very fond, uh, young bhaktas, especially among <laughs> Shurabindu devotees, <laughs> I have often uh, spoken about it that how do you even compare? It's like comparing uh, maybe an ant in a Himalaya because you know thinker, philosopher, psychologist are a different domain and a mystic, a spiritual realizer and Shubindu is more than that. It's something very different. But nevertheless, when Shubindu was asked about Jung, he says, uh, the question was, Jung accepts Freud's view and considers religion as something to be escaped from. The primal desire for re-entrance to the womb, never expressing itself nakedly, but veiling itself as Freud had supposed under all kinds of symbolism, gives us in this very symbolism what history has called religion. 
This is what I should call mental aberration and encephalitis as a result of biological psychology. So, and they don't, I mean, this is so evident. I mean, I remember one year back, one of my poems was like this. Ma tumhare garbh mein phir se samana chata hu. Its sense was not at all any of these things. It's to be reborn, born anew, into a new vision, new understanding. And this is an inner birth which the yogis, mystics aspired for. So here Shubhinda says, it is part of the general aberration that has beset the modern world owing to the descent of the vital world into the physical. And then he gives some example because when the new creation is going to come, all kinds of forces rush in. I am the new, I am the new, I am the new. So every fashionable thing is not new creation. Because many such things are simply vital. They imitate the new and we may believe that it is new. So Sri says, uh, give some example. I don't know, people may like it or not like it. Cubist and surrealist painting. It is so true, you know, cubist is otherwise regarded as great art. But this is largely inspired by the vital. If you look at that, it doesn't convey the depth. It, and of course, you can discover your own meaning. That's a different story altogether. And then he clubs it, modernist poetry, Nazi politics, psychoanalysis. The more extravagant the thing, the greater its reputation and success. So that famous example of Rembrandt where he, you know, his palette scrapings he has put on a canvas and somebody said, this is so wonderful. I am willing to give so much money for it. And they couldn't appreciate his real paintings because it, it is an exaggerated extravaganza, colors, weird forms, a horse's mouth is here and a hand is coming out from elsewhere. And you know, this is called as great painting, a completely dismembering things. But then, you know, that is what is called as freedom in art. And <laughs> so, at present, in the European world, it is novelty and extravagance in ideas that are run after. So, you know, you, you show something very magical and this thing, dazzling, and that's what there is a tendency to run after. I don't know anything firsthand about Jung, Shubindu continues. But the two extracts from him you have given do not encourage me to make acquaintance. Why on earth should the idea of God or gods be a bondage? I suppose it is the Semitic idea common in Europe of God is a terrible... Now look at the way he is expressing it. He is saying, no, you should be freed from gods and God. God's okay, but God. Uh, so he says that I suppose it is the Semitic idea of God as a terrible... Gentleman upstairs, emperor, lawmaker, judge and policeman who sends you to hell at his pleasure. To the Indian mind, the gods are friends and help us. We don't see them like that. Never actually. <laughs> they are always benevolent creatures. We do so much. Even when we spoil the temple, break the coconut, you ultimately feel he is going to fulfill your wishes. And then his appreciation of some of the great names. I have obviously not included. It's a whole big volume. Uh, Bankim Chand, Sri rated very high. And uh, when somebody depreciated him, so he says, depreciation of Bankim is absurd. He is and will always rank as one of the great creators. And his prose stands among the 10 or 12 best prose styles in the world's literature. So, even if, okay... Style we may not appreciate if you don't know Bengali. But reading at least Anand Mutt is something I think for every Indian. And I think in modern times it's not only must, it should be probably more easily available. Shurbindo has also translated portion of it, I think till chapter 15. And then there is also Barin's translation of Anand Mutt. But... Uh, I think read any other good standard translation so that you'll get the full story flowing through. Shobindar did not translate the whole. So that's a pity. Then Sarachand, what is stamped on Sarachand? Sarachand Chattopadhyay, we all know, some of us must have read his novels. Uh, what is stamped on Sarachand? 
its work everywhere is a large intelligence an acute and accurate observation of men and things and a heart full of sympathy for sorrow and suffering too sensitive to be quite at ease with the world and also perhaps too clear sighted much fineness of mind and refinement of the vital nature he had come here he wanted to live here as a disciple of shivindo but he had that habit of drinking at some point and shivindo had to say he is very fine <laughs> i'll help him but this is going to scandalize <laughs> so ultimately even harinna chatopadhyay that's how he went away but otherwise as far as his poetry is concerned shubhendu spoke about his writing as the most authentic indian voice in english poetry and yet because of certain reasons actually he left shubhendu didn't ask him to go so how they used to keep everyone and look at one good thing that is something repeatedly we find we look at the defects and shubhendu and the mother will see that thing which is beautiful and encourage it and by that as it grows and that's the way yoga proceeds that mother picks up first something in us which is open and receptive so we think oh so beautiful and then that part develops so the army of light begins to enter <laughs> then after some time the little less open but which can be open and then finally the last battle like indra and vritta sur is in the darkest parts the shadow which is in everybody but it's not like in the beginning they start uh, like us uh, moral police do this don't do this this bad this good no not like that every little part in someone which is open beautiful this to work through that so we see this um, constantly with them now this is a very wonderful letter we, i have mentioned this letter elsewhere but today i would like to read it in full so the letter is that dilip kumar roy asked shurbindo about um, writing of uh, anatoly france and he says he says that what is it that you know uh, they say that god is omniscient and omnipotent but uh, we see so much evil and suffering in the world so is it that he can cure it but doesn't cure it he can correct it because he is omnipotent or is it that he Uh, cannot cure it though he wants to cure it or is it that he can neither cure it nor wants to cure it and then he says in the first case whether he can cure it but doesn't cure it so he is perverse and if he cannot cure it but wants to cure it matlab he is well meaning but he is not omnipotent and if he cannot either so he is uh, obviously uh, <laughs> you have to change the definition so shurbindo's uh, Dilip Kumar Roy sent this passage to Shirbindo. I wonder what God might answer to it, supposing He should ever feel inclined to. This is a question which many people ask. Of course, this Shirbindo has answered at length in the Life Divine, countless letters. But here he writes in a similar vein. Anna Tole France is always amusing. See, he is not saying he is absurd. What does he know about God? Look at when Shirbindo is even. pointing something even in his criticism there is a joy there is a generosity he start by saying anatole france is always amusing whether he is ironizing about god and christianity or about that rational animal man or humanity with a big h we start with that that he is he is full of irony and irony is something interesting and the follies of his reason and his conduct but i presume you never heard of god's explanation of his non interference to anatole france when they met in some heaven of irony so now come shervindos i suppose it can't have been in the heaven of karl marx <laughs> look at in one sentence he is heaven of karl marx then itself he knows what is this going to bring is heaven where all are equal all will be you know fed equally and now we all know the entire communist propaganda machine but he says that <laughs> in spite of francis conversion before his death because he ultimately you know became okay communist ideal <laughs> so i suppose okay 
God is reported to have strolled up to him and said, I say, Anatole, you know that was a good joke of yours. <laughs> but there was a good cause too for my non-interference. Why he didn't interfere? His reason came along and told me, Look here, why do you pretend to exist? So reason comes and tells God, why do you pretend to exist? You know you don't exist and <laughs> never existed. Or if you do, you have made such a mess of your creation that we can't tolerate you any longer. Once we have got you out of the way, all will be all right upon earth. Tip top, A1. My daughter, now reason is saying my daughter, science and I have arranged that between us. You just go away. First of all, look at it. The irony in which Shobhin is replying. Reason is telling God, you don't exist. Matlab, it's a paradox. And if you exist, why is it this? I think you go out of the way, then everything will be fine. That's what we, I have arranged with my daughter. <laughs> Science. Man will raise his noble brow, the head of creation, dignified, free, equal, fraternal, democratic, Depending upon nothing but himself, with nothing greater than himself anywhere in existence. There will be no God, no gods, no churches, no priestcraft, no religion, no kings, no oppression, no poverty, no war or discord anywhere. Shubhinda gives states the problem in a real detail. This still Anatole France continuing. Commerce will spread. Huh? Industry will fill the earth with abundance. Commerce will spread our golden reconciling wings everywhere. Universal education will stamp out ignorance and leave no room for folly or unreason in any human brain. Man will become cultured, disciplined, rational, scientific, well-informed, arriving always at the right conclusion upon full and sufficient data. The voice of the scientist and the expert will be loud in the land and guide mankind to the earthly paradise. All this is described in Savitri with you know, beautiful humor again in the triple, several places. Um, that how wisdom got petrified, shut in scholastic lines and elsewhere in triple soul forces. So he says that all this will happen. The voice of the scientist and the expert, you have no place. Mysticism has no place. Will be loud in the land and guide mankind to the earthly paradise. A perfected society, health universalized by a developed medical science and a sound hygiene. Everything rationalized, science evolved, infallible, omnipotent, omniscient. Add AI and AI, ver AI versions. The riddle of existence solved, the parliament of man, the federation of the world, uplifting for our backward brown, yellow and black brothers. <laughs> peace, 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 reason, order, unity everywhere. There was a lot more like that. Shabindu is saying Anatole France tells all this to God. Anatole, now God is saying, Anatole and I was so much impressed by the beauty of the picture and its convenience. For I would have nothing to do or to supervise that I once retired from business. God said, so wonderful. Man has grown so much. He doesn't need me. Very good. I'll retire for a while. <laughs> so he retired. It is a movie, Bruce Almighty. Is roughly touching upon one aspect of it. So he retired. I said, okay, you take over. For... You know that I was always of a retiring disposition and inclined to keep myself behind the veil or in the background at the best of times. Shy nature. Why would he? He is not like the aggressive, ambitious person pushing himself forward. He retires. If. But what is this I hear? It does not seem to me from reports that reason, even with the help of science, has kept her promise. And if not, why not? Is it because she would not or because she could not? Now he's in the same vein. 
और इज इट बिकॉज शी बोथ वुड नॉट एंड कुड नॉट और बिकॉज शी वुड एंड कुड बट सम आउट डिड नॉट एंड आई से अनातोले दिस चिल्ड्रन ऑफ देयर्स द स्टेट इंडस्ट्रियलिज्म कैपिटलिज्म कम्युनिज्म एंड द रेस्ट हैव ए क्वियर लुक दे सीम वेरी मच लाइक टाइटेनिक मॉन्स्टर सो ट्रू नाउ इट इज ऑल बींग इन द नेम ऑफ डेमोक्रेसी डिमोलिश विच एवर नेशन यू वॉन्ट्स टू डिस्ट्रॉय इन द नेम ऑफ कम्युनिज्म कैप्चर एनी लैंड दैट यू वॉन्ट टू ऑल दिस सो ही हैज सीन ऑल दिस सो बट इवन देन ही इज एबल टू सी ऑल दिस arm too with all the power of intellect and all the weapons and organizations of science and it does look as if mankind were no freer under them than under the kings and the churches what has happened or is it possible that reason is not supreme and infallible even that she has made a greater mess of it than i could have done myself <laughs> it's so true if you look at the age of reason within few hundred years what a mess here the report of conver- the conversation ends and i give it for what it is worth for i am not acquainted with this god and have to take him on trust from anatole france he says his god is his god how beautiful this answer is and look at the humor then he speaks about inspiration so beautifully he says that is the ideal way that you keep quiet and let inspiration come from within but see how humorously he explains but usually there is always an activity of the mind jumping up and trying to catch the inspiration sometimes the inspiration the right one comes in the midst of this futile jumping sometimes it sweeps it aside and brings in the right thing sometimes it inserts itself between two blunders sometimes it waits till the noise quiets down but even this jumping need not be a mental effort it is often only a series of suggestions so he gives the process and then he says when the real effort is produced okay i'll just jump to another one so so he describes all this and then niruddha asks him you proclaim the force and inspiration from the house top but fail to see that one has to work hour after hour to get it what will you call this labor shubhendra uses the word hammering <laughs> making a beastly noise so that inspiration may get excited and exasperated and fling something through the window muttering i hope that this will keep this insufferable tin smith quiet so that is the thing that when we speak about inspiration it's not like oh what what should be here what is the line that is should come oh maybe this i am looking for it just the opposite way to remain quiet and and wait sometimes the first line or half a line or half a stanza may come so one has to wait and then suddenly after some time the rest comes or a flow comes the poets who have written over 50 years any had a virgil 50 years he composed waiting for the right inspiration so one has to learn to wait there is no other way then of course he has spoken of uh someone asked him that why can't poets write about mathematics or how in mathematics there is a universal uh, acceptance and joy uh, why not in poetry and shurbindo with his usual humor he says what does he mean that you can't write mathematics in verse i suppose not it was not meant to be you can't start off and then he gives two very interesting lines you can't start off oh 2 by 3 plus 4 plus 7 to add things is to be in heaven <laughs> such, a, such a beautiful you i mean is really raso vesa softy softy and mighty as the mountains and yet shubhendra is like that makhan 
that you know krishna we see these two aspects madhuram madhuram makkhan makkhan but all the same if one thinks it worthwhile to take the trouble one can express the mathematician's delight in discovery or the grammarians in grammatizing or the engineers in planning a bridge or a house and then he speaks about the mass appeal very often people say this oh but shurabindu is difficult what about the masses now you know he of course we all know the answer but the way shurabindu gives the answer so he says it is not because they appeal only to a few people and not to the general run of humanity a good dinner appeals not to a few people but to the general run of humanity but it would all the same be a little difficult to write an epic or a lyric on the greatness of cooking and fine dishes or the joys of the palate and the belly he says you can't make these subjects poetry is about things which are sublime and transcendent and beautiful he says yeah but if you write like this it will probably appeal the masses are like that how many people will appreciate it is a question which is irrelevant to the merit of the poetry more people have appreciated sincerely macaulay's lays or kipling's barrack room ballads ballads than ever really appreciated timon of athens or paradise regained but that does not determine the relative value or appropriateness of these things as poetry and we know that uh, even shurbindo's um, uh, you know his appreciation of this uh, francis thomas the hound of heaven and he says that that is one poetry which has put his name in the list of the greatest poets but there's the only one really marvelous poem all the rest is relatively average shubindu says that but one poem is enough so okay then there are of course um, again about the numbers i do not find your argument from numbers very convincing your 999999 people would also prefer a jazz and turn away from beethoven or only hear him as a duty <laughs> and would feel happy in a theater listening to a common dance tune and cold and dull to the music of tansen that's so true i mean it is so evident so this idea that masses don't understand because masses are lazy they don't want to make an effort and the taste of the masses in present times have been thoroughly spoiled in fact viciously spoiled even 50 years back even in the songs there was a mu- music that was lilting the lyrics were something which could uplift you but now and you know especially with the hip hop and how much appeal it it has which which passes off as great poetry and great uh, music and dance <laughs> so if satisfaction in the experience is to be the test yogic peace wins by 100 lengths however you write as if i had said peace was the one and only thing to be had by yoga i said it was a basis the only possible secure basis for all other divine experience so the person asks that well okay yoga gives only peace but all the rest dance music art everything else so he is saying that no everything can be uplifted and become an instrument for expression and manifestation as part of the yoga then another very humorous letter where somebody asked that which art or music or painting which of the arts is better and shubindu says i fear i must disappoint you i am not going to pass the gods through a competitive exam <laughs> and assign a highest place to one and lower places to others what an idea each has his or her own province on the summits and what is the necessity of putting them in rivalry with each other it is a sort of judgment of paris who want to impose on me well but what became of paris and troy you want me to give the crown or the apple to music and enrage the goddesses of painting sculpture architecture embroidery all the nine muses so that they will kick at our publications and exhibitions and troop off to other places we shall have to build in the future what then shall we do if the goddess of architecture turns severely and says 
आई एम एन इन्फीरियर पावर हेम आई गो एंड आस्क योर नि रोड टू बिल्ड योर हाउस विथ इज बिलव एड म्यूजिक सो ऑल इंस्पिरेशन ऑल ऑफ दैम दैट्स वॉट परफेक्शन इज अबाउट एवरी थिंग इज डेवलप्ड एंड टूगेदर एंड स्पीकिंग ऑफ आर्ट्स मोर पीपल गो टू द थिएटर और रीड फिक्शन देन गो टू द ओपेरा और ए कंसर्ट वॉट बिकम्स देन ऑफ द सुपीरियर यूनिवर्सैलिटी ऑफ म्यूजिक सो वेल प्लेंटी ऑफ दैम एंड आई एल जस्ट कम बैक टू समथिंग ऑन ब्यूटी सम वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग ऑब्जर्वेशन ऑफ शिवरबिंद वन ऑफ दैम इज ऑफकोर्स मद हेज स्पोकन अबाउट इट ब्यूटी इज द वे इन विच द फिजिकल एक्सप्रेस इज द डिवाइन but the principle and law of beauty is something inward and spiritual which expresses itself through the form the form can begin to even that beauty which is universal inside can begin to reflect itself through the form not that it would change the form so he is distinguishing between the form in the sense structure the way it is built and the beauty which is present inside which can begin to show up in form and shubhendra speaks about supramental beauty and he says beauty is the special divine manifestation in the physical as truth is in the mind love in the heart power in the vital supramental beauty is the highest divine beauty manifesting in matter and he says very difficult to experience beauty a great equality and the view of the divine everywhere is necessary for this to come fully if one is unable to see the divine everywhere rather if one is seeing all the time hostile forces and dark forces <laughs> everywhere <laughs> then the mind is full of ugliness then you begin to appreciate beauty and this one is a bit uh, sobering to all who believe ah they look very beautiful human beauty is not always the picture of the good it is sometimes the mask of evil the reality behind that mask is not always goodness there is a uni that universal beauty which is seen by the inner eye heard by the inner ear etc but the individual consciousness responds to some forms not to others so that's about affinity like the negro he would call a black woman beautiful and you ask in punjab they will say jo soni to sikhni whoever is fair is beautiful if you go to a mystic he will say saavra salona so this conception of beauty it changes as far as individual consciousness but beauty as such as a principle you have to see it and hear it with the inner ear and with the inner vision so what is meant by hearing beauty so sometimes even in a speech with me sound outwardly strange not according to our typical convention yet one may feel in it a great beauty a truth which is shining through and we'll see that in especially in mahabharata in some of the uh, phrases uttered by draupadi and many others and then he speaks about reading can be only momentary help to prepare the mind but the real knowledge does not come by reading some preparation for the inner knowledge may be helpful at the same time the development of the mind is a useful preliminary for the sadhak it can also be pursued along with the sadhana on condition that it is not given too big a place and does not interfere with the one important thing the sadhana itself then somebody has asked a question learning languages makes the mind active does not the yoga mean to keep the mind quiet and turn it always to the divine so should we those have answer do you mean to say that in order to have quietness of the mind one must do nothing then neither the mother nor i nor anyone else here has a quiet mind is the only sure we can write with that humor then of course what is the need for so many here to learn french and look at how people could ask this question if you read you wonder what a freedom i mean one wonders at the humility of shurbindo the person is asking disciple is asking shurbindo 
वट इज द नीड फॉर सो मेनी हेयर टू लंच फ्रेंच टिल देन इट्स ओके फर्दर आर यू प्रिपेयरिंग दैम फॉर गिविंग लेक्चर्स और ओपनिंग सेंटर्स इन फ्रांस और फ्रेंच नोइंग कंट्रीज कैन वी इमेजिन एनी बडी आस्किंग द गुरु लाइक दैट इन इंडिया एज ए इंडियन वज आस्ट श्योर बिंदो एंड श्योर बिंदो इज रिप्लाई इट इज इज नॉट दैट्स वाई ह्यूमिलिटी कंपैशन इज नॉट वट डू यू नो If something is being done, you should take it as final, ultimate, absolute. Look at how Shivendra replies. That's why the mother said humility and compassion, and perfect gentle manliness. So Shivendra replies, "Our life and mind to be governed only by material utility or outward practicality. Spiritual life would then be inferior, even to ordinary mental life, where people learn for the sake of acquiring knowledge." and culturing the mind and not only for the sake of some outward utility he has given a completely new impersonal universal answer of course people should learn many thing nothing wrong with that as such and he is addressing to the consciousness same thing he speaks about you know reading newspapers and all these things so the question is in the new creation would there not be great musicians painters poets athletes etc created from the ashram shobindo says all kinds that are needed for the work or for the manifestation would i suppose come and then couple of short letters after which we can stop he speaks about one of course music which comes from above and he says that uh, I meant exactly the same thing as when I wrote to you that the famous singer must disappear and the inner singer take her place. This idea that I am famous, I'll sing to an audience, the audience will appreciate me, that becomes unyogic. But if you let the music flow, song flow from the inmost heart or from something above carrying that vibration, then it's a different thing. And then for dance he says dance alone with rhythm and significance can express something of the occult as we see in uh, the mother's uh, description in savitri book 1 canto 2 as a priestess of immaculate ecstasies and they speaks about dancing in truth's mystic vault so these dances were actually initially very occult practices in india they are they have always been like that so what they do through the movements they align the energies they heal that's how shamans used to heal and that's why after seeing an uplifting dance it can have a very strong healing and practicing dance also because it sets into rhythm many things inside us music and dance by the way have strong healing um side effects on us why because uh, illness is a disharmony so when you dance or listen to but of course uplifting music not jazz and all that can make us fall sick because they draw all kinds of vital dark forces but something which is high uplifting it's it's flows through the brain you hear and then it goes into the nervous system which is the hub of all the forces the brain and from the brain it flows through the nerve into the entire system so the brain mechanisms if they get into a rhythm it begins to set the rest of the body in a rhythm and now people are doing research on how music can heal and it is so less tried i wish one day that in our healing nursing home and other places we'll have you know just music and healing <laughs> music and mantra healing but right now if you advise somebody comes with an illness you say do this chanting of om or ma <laughs> five times a day <laughs> I'll be maybe refer to a psychiatrist and say, "Baki kam thik hai." <laughs> It's just nothing else. But we have been caged by the, you know, modern science. So dance expresses something of the occult or of the divine as much as writing or poetry or art. So again, poetry, reading should be those poetry and savitri, especially has a healing. Even logically, it should have, simply because it is rhythmic. or just hearing it because it's rhythm highest rhythm so it is the power all creation starts with rhythm 
and all disorder is because as it, as it descends the rhythm becomes disorderly so music and poetry have very healing i myself experienced reading shubhendu's baji prabhu while on almost uh, half unconscious and suddenly with the reading the entire system gets energized and within half an hour i was all up and awake all energetic because that poetry has that capacity and power and of course uh, can dancing not become part of the yoga like poetry music and painting and again the universal answer for everything if it is done in the right spirit so uday shankar had come here now i was hesitating that should i should i not <laughs> and uh, both mother and shubhin the discouraged people from you know going and learning from him and all that and then he gives his answer but we answered like that because uday shankar's coming brought only the vital side with it and dancing in its vital side is a personal affair and cannot be part of yoga and whenever she the mother would see people get into that uh, you know that famous story which uh, with which we can close dilip kumar roy was singing and indra devi was dancing and of course dilip kumar roy is a very special or he i mean of course for sure when everybody is special but he felt that and uh, while he was dancing mother was watching suddenly mother got up and went away and she later explained the da- that dance had to be stopped because lot of vital forces of a lower kind were just entering in that atmosphere so had she continued it would have had a disastrous effect because you know you can't uh, so she said okay you continue and she quietly went away it was a grace a compassion which uh, was not understood and then she would have to explain to the blue eyed boy that well Uh, this was the reason why she went not because she didn't appreciate or because she is angry with you <laughs> so he says if it is done in the right spirit it can so he brought the vital side and dancing in its vital side is a personal affair and cannot be part of yoga it would only raise the vital turn in the consciousness and this is so important because we have so many dances and programs here also and uh, we have songs we have dances and while freedom is okay but we must understand what shurvindu is saying privately you want to do anything it's between you and the divine you want to crash but when we do it publicly then we are drawing into the atmosphere certain forces which may not be healthy for the collective consciousness so the choices should be done with great care and wisdom with this we'll stop this completes the Uh, collected works of shurbindo volume 27 next time we'll start with the series on letters on yoga thank you